Yeah, hello, and uh, welcome to today's seminar, hosted by the International Inequalities Institute at LSE. Uh, my name is Valentina Contreras, and I'm a research officer at the III. I'm incredibly pleased uh, to be chairing today's seminar titled Cultural Capital and Access to Opportunity in India, uh, which is part of the III Inequality Seminar Series. Today's speaker is Dr. Sam Asher, uh, Sam is an Associate Professor of Economics and Public Policy at Imperial College London and co-founder of Development Data Lab, which works to maximize the value of underutilized data for policymakers, civil society, and the private sector in India and Europe. Sam's research seeks to understand the microeconomic determinants and economic the microeconomic determinants of economic growth, urbanization, and economic opportunity for the poor. May I ask our online audience to please keep yourself muted. As usual, there will be the chance for you to post questions to the speaker following the presentation. We will take questions from both the in-person and online audience. I will now hand over to Sam. Uh, many thanks all and enjoy the event. Okay, thank you so much for that kind of introduction. Um, really, really nice to be here. Um, this is just the perfect audience for me to be presenting this work to. I'm, I'm trying to understand inequality here, um, focusing in India, um, but we think we're, we're kind of studying something a bit more universal in cultural capital, an idea that very much um, is a very deep and deeply researched idea in sociology and, and related fields has kind of barely come into economics. And part of what we're hoping to do in this paper is to bring it in a bit more and think about how we might be able to, to measure it and test for its effects. Um, so this is joint work with my longtime collaborator, Paul Novosad, who's at Dartmouth College, uh, Didi Bomek, who was a pre-doc with us and is now a PhD student at Harvard, and Mauricio Busoldo, who's uh, an economist at the World Bank in the South Asian Chief Economist's office. Um, just to confirm, I'm aiming for quarter past to wrap this up? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, but please do jump in in the meantime with clarifying questions. I understand we'll, we'll have more discussion later, but uh, I'm an economist. We're used to being interrupted. Uh, so this is part of a broader agenda of mine, trying to understand uh, inequality in India and beyond. Um, and, and really, what a lot of my work does is trying to study um, what I often call development in high resolution. What are the highly local factors that shape people's lives, that shape people's access to opportunity? I think looking around the room, many of us probably were not born in London. We've moved very long distances for economic opportunities. and. Uh, maybe social opportunities and others, um, we're, we're pretty rare. Most people actually stick pretty close to home. Um, their kids go to school nearby. Their businesses trade with people within a very short radius. And what my work tries to do is really understand what about that economic environment seems to give so much more opportunity to some people and, and so much less to others. Um, in this particular agenda on, on inequality in India, we, we have a series of papers um, really trying to drill down to both the spatial and social determinants of, uh, of economic opportunity and, and uh, poverty alleviation. So we have a bunch of work on intergenerational mobility, and here's sort of the headline figure from our work on mobility, which is basically showing mobility over the past 50 years in India has been broadly flat. These are the rank outcomes for uh, children, uh, educational rank outcomes for children born to parents whose education was in the bottom half of their distribution for their cohort. Um, upper caste is obviously doing much better than everyone else, but major divergence between India's largest marginalized communities with scheduled castes closing half of the gap with upper castes while Muslims falling pretty far behind. Um, so we have these huge cross group differences, even though overall mobility in India has stayed pretty flat. We have some newer work suggesting that India, even though it's been growing economically very, very quickly over the last several decades, is one of the least upwardly mobile countries in South Asia, even compared to other countries that have much worse overall economic performance. And South Asia itself is very low mobility compared to the rest of the world. Um, we have new work on residential segregation and trying to understand um, what that looks like and, and what uh, are the economic consequences of the very high levels of segregation we see in India. Um, and finding very large disparities in economic outcomes and in the provision of public goods across neighborhoods, where scheduled caste and especially Muslim neighborhoods are much, much less likely to get things like health centers and especially government secondary schools um, with quite large consequences for the children growing up there. Um, and then finally, in, in a bunch of related work, we show just the scale of the variation across space 
in India in economic outcomes. This is looking at average village poverty rates. And we basically find that half of the variation across village poverty rates is actually within districts across villages. So most policymaking happens at sort of targeting things to backward states, or I'm using the word backwards because that's how Indian policymakers use the word backwards districts, places that are lagging behind other places, but actually half of the variation in poverty rates, at least village average poverty rates, um, are within those districts. So there's so much we need to do both to understand why we see so much variation at the local level and, and to try to address it. Okay, all that said, what's this paper about? Um, here we're trying to, to study cultural capital. Cultural capital is, is a big idea in, in sociology, uh, hasn't really made it into economics much. Um, there are many different kind of definitions um, that are kicking around, but I think to, to kind of distill it, I would say that cultural capital are the non-financial social assets that promote mobility in a stratified society. So this can mean knowing uh, and adhering to elite social norms, knowing how to hold your knife and fork, or when you're at Oxford High Table, knowing which direction to pass the port, right? Um, knowing how to speak in a particular way. There are many, many, many dialects of English. They're all perfectly good at communicating the ideas that we want to communicate. But if I want to get a job in Lower Manhattan, I better speak kind of NPR English. If I want to get a, if I want to get something done in in Harlem in Upper Manhattan, Black vernacular English is going to be a lot more useful. So it's about kind of knowing the norms and so on as well as the language of the people who kind of hold access to opportunity in a given location. Habits and hobbies, you know, uh, it's probably useful to play golf if you want to seal business deals in many parts of the UK and the US. Um, my co-author Paul had a, a roommate in grad school uh, who was from Nepal and who then went into um, working in, in banking in, uh, in Wall Street. And he talked about how he's getting he knows that the people who make the most money and get ahead the most in the firm are actually those who are involved in sales and closing deals with clients, but that he's never going to be able to get one of those jobs because he doesn't kind of know the various habits and hobbies and other things of the groups that he's trying to want to close deals with. So that's just sort of close to him, regardless of how talented or able he is in other regards. There are many sociological studies suggesting that cultural capital plays a pretty big role in various domains from the educational system to the professional workplace. There's a bunch of work on business interactions and even international trade seems to be shaped by cultural similarity and, and the holding of cultural capital by different groups to even access to healthcare. Um, but as I said, this, this idea has gotten sort of limited traction in economics in part due to this quite broad definition, as you guys can see, it's pretty expensive and we can think of a lot of things that may or may not kind of fit that, um, in part because it's a challenging thing to measure um, and in part because in economics, we try to study things with exogenous variation. We want to talk about the causal effects of something and not just what it's correlated with. Um, and of course, cultural capital is correlated with all sorts of things out there in the world, all sorts of disadvantages. Um, and so getting variation that allows us to isolate the impact of cultural capital from other factors is tricky. The other part of the motivation here is thinking about inequality in India. And India is a very, very unequal country, as I said, uh, very low rates of, of mobility. We think that a lot of this has to do with the historical caste system. Um, and there's a lot of evidence in the economics literature suggesting that caste shapes so much of the economic opportunities that a person faces. Um, that dependence on caste networks can hinder migration. Um, caste differences act as a barrier to trade uh, within villages, even something like trade in, in water. Um, it has frictions introduced by, by caste differences. Caste identity can shape lender borrower relationships uh, and, and public service delivery as well. Um, but I would point out that while India has thousands of different uh, endogamous communities, distinct ethnic and social groups, um, there's pretty limited research on understanding the differences across these groups beyond the really broad categories. Again, I'm talking about economics, I think anthropologists and others who work with more qualitative methods and of often taking this stuff much more seriously, but in economics, we very rarely move beyond the very broad categories of, of general caste, other backwards caste, social scheduled caste, and, and scheduled tribes. So what are we going to do in this paper? We're going to try to test for the role of cultural capital as distinct from a bunch of other sources of disadvantage. Um, 
And we're positing that it may be an important driver of the group inequalities. So for our working definition, we're going to try to tighten things up a little bit from the original definition I gave you and say cultural characteristics that lower the cost of cooperating with the people who control resources in a given context. Okay? And that can take a bunch of different forms. It might be that by having cultural characteristics that lower this cost of cooperating with elites, that it leads to me, my being discriminated against less, right? My father, my family's Jewish. My father grew up in very, very Jewish Brooklyn in a high school that was 99% Jewish. When he went away to college, he tried to scrub his accent of the Brooklyn Jewish accent so that people would treat him better, okay? So maybe, maybe it's about reducing discrimination. Maybe it's about trust. Discrimination and trust are not exactly the same things. I might have reason to trust less the people who have different cultural norms than me, not because they're inherently untrustworthy, but because there's going to be some way that's going to make it difficult for us to work together if we have these sort of different cultural norms. Um, it might be frictions in, in coordination or collaboration. So um, what we're going to do to get some empirical traction on this is to leverage the fact that India has nearly 5,000 of these distinct social groups. They have very different norms, customs, values, and beliefs. These things are usually quite hard to measure. We're going we're gonna to tell you how we measure them. Um, there's obviously a huge literature thinking about how specific cultural heritages might facilitate access to economic opportunity. It might be good, inherently good to be Protestant or inherently good to have you know, uh, notions of autonomy or, or personal agency or other things might just be good for your own economic outcomes. That's not the angle we're going to be taking here. The angle we're going to be taking here is that we're going to focus on the interaction of my own cultural characteristics with the cultural characteristics of the people who control opportunities around me. Okay, Because one of the reasons why we're kind of skeptical of trying to go looking for the returns to specific cultural characteristics is that if I look in India, I'm going to, and I just regress, say, economic outcomes on something like vegetarianism, I'm going to find that, oh, it looks like vegetarianism is really, really good for economic outcomes. But that's because Brahmins tend to be more vegetarian and lower caste groups tend to be less vegetarian. It's not actually teaching us about vegetarianism. It's teaching us about the whole bundle of things that come along with vegetarianism and how they give people greater advantages. So we're really going to try to step out of this trap by focusing on the interactions of one's own cultural characteristics and those of the people around. So in order to do this, um, we're bringing, we're building a, a massive new data set on cultural characteristics. So we have the digitized cultural norms, 360 distinct cultural norms of nearly 5,000 endogamous groups. These are the castes and tribes and so on of India um, from the People of India Anthropological Surveys. Now, these were conducted between 1985 and 1992 and are an attempt to try to understand the cultural norms of every single group in India. And it, it was said by, by the people of India, of the people of India, for the people of India. This was based on a colonial exercise that was done by the British from about 1880 to 1920. Um, thankfully, the Indian government dropped some of the more scientific racist parts of what the British were doing, uh, like measuring skull sizes and nose widths and, and so on and so forth. Um, but it was really a celebration of the cultural richness and diversity of India. Uh, hard to imagine it being done today. Um, but this was done in the 1980s um, and generated this incredible, incredible data on, on India's cultural diversity. We're going to measure, in this case, an absence of cultural capital, which is going to be measuring the difference between one's own cultural characteristics and those of the dominant group in the place where one lives. I'll get into the details of all of this stuff much, much more. I'm just kind of giving you guys a bit of a sense of where we're going. Um, so to be clear, we're really measuring only part of cultural capital. There are many, many different things that go into cultural capital, as I've already alluded. Um, we're going to be kind of measuring the fixed component of cultural capital, those historical cultural norms that my community has, and measuring how those might be different from the people around me. Right? It's not to say I might be historically vegetarian, but I can decide to eat meat. Maybe I decide to eat meat in order to gain more access to opportunity. That's not going to be what we're going off of here. We're going to be going off of what historically did your community do? And by in that way, trying to kind of get away from the individual choices that individuals make in order to try to close this, this cultural capital gap, this cultural difference gap. 
And what we're going to find is that cultural distance from the dominant group in a given location leads to much lower educational attainment. One standard deviation uh, in cultural distance to the elites in a village lowers educational attainment by a quarter of a year, really sizable. Um, worse anthropometric measures and, and lower consumption and in income. People are considerably worse off when they're lacking in cultural similarity to the elites in their area. And to be clear, this is holding within groups. This is all about comparing ashers who might be found in different places. And in some of those places, they're more culturally proximate. Some of those places, they're more culturally distant from the elites. Again, I'll get into all this stuff in much more detail. All right, let me tell you guys a little bit more about the context. Um, quick primer on, on caste in India. So um, when, when people use the English word caste, they, they mean different things in the Indian context. Um, one of the things they mean is Varna. And Varna are the broad social classes in Hindu society. So these are the Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, and Shudras. Um, those are very broadly the priests, warriors, um, sort of skilled artisans and laborers. Um, but that's a very, very broad categorization. And obviously, people don't always fall very neatly into them. The scheduled castes, or Dalits, or used to be referred to as untouchables, uh, are considered avarna, not having avarna. Um, and for this reason, I'm often referred to as outcasts. Um, but for people's daily lives, what often is more consequential is Jati. And these are the endogamous subgroups, often within the Varna system, usually within the Varna system, um, that within which people marry, with it, that have their own distinct cultural characteristics. They historically have their own uh, traditional occupations, but dietary restrictions, various other taboos, marriage practices, these are the things that vary across these different groups. Um, Within these groups, we have sublineages, often called gotra. Um, we're not gonna we're not gonna be worrying about these right now. We're really gonna focus on this sort of level here. These are the distinct groups that make up the entire population of India, basically. Um, these jati groups, as I said, traditionally endogamous, which reinforces social stratification. One British historian said, "Imagine that every person in Britain named Baker had to be a baker and could only marry other people named Baker." Okay, give you a little bit of a sense of what the caste system is like. Um, the genetic evidence that's been coming out in recent decades is suggesting actually for 3,000 years or more of near total endogamy, where these groups have been completely distinct. The genetic record doesn't tell us about the, the social stratification and hierarchy and whether there's been churn there, but these groups have been ethnically distinct for that long. Marrying out of caste can often result in heavy censure or even violence. Um, and the reason why I'm going to use in this presentation the word group rather than the word caste is because India has about 3,500 of these different jatis that are Hindu within the formal caste system, but about 1,000 additional groups which are not Hindu jatis, um, but that have the same basic characteristics in the sense that they're endogamous and have distinct cultural norms. These groups can be scheduled tribes. These groups can be within the Muslim community. There are many, many different groups within the Christian community, within the Jain community. There are different groups that have different practices and cultural traditions and that, that emphasize marrying amongst themselves. Um, these social groups often come from particular regions. Some groups have much larger geographic coverage than others, um, but are often very locally segregated. So in, in, if there's such a thing as a typical Indian village, and there are 600,000 villages in India, and obviously things vary enormously, um, villages are often very segregated by caste groups. And so if you're looking for someone, the first thing that you'll be asked is what their name is or what their caste is. And then people will point you to where in the village you should go. And it's often very, very clear as you cross a street or a lane that you're crossing from one neighborhood to another. Um, lower caste groups are often both socially and spatially marginalized um, with greater distance to public facilities like schools or roads or electricity or so on. Contrast this with Africa, where a lot of the sort of cultural work and economics is being done right now based on the ethnographic atlas of Murdoch. Um, where ethnic groups are often associated with these more homogenous homelands. So there's a Kikuyu area or so on. Um, but in India, groups live on top of each other. In our particular data, we have an average of six groups in a given village. Okay. A given village will have a dominant group and will have a number of different non-dominant groups. Um, so the result of, of all of this, this enormous cultural diversity, um, and the fact that everyone's kind of living on top of each other is that you're going to have huge variation both across and within villages in the cultural distances across groups. 
Another important concept that I've just alluded to so far is the notion of dominant caste. And this really goes back to the, the anthropological work of, of Srinivas in 1959, who was writing about a village in, in the south of India, in Tamil Nadu, but um, this kind of work has been extended in many different directions. But the basic insight is that a typical Indian village will have one or max two, or usually one, dominant caste who owns most of the land. So in our data, actually 53% of the land in a given village is owned by the, 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 the group that owns the most land in that place. Okay. And from the ownership of land, which is the major input in an agrarian society, and rural India is still very, very much agrarian. There are very few non-farm jobs in rural India. Um, from that control of the land flows control of local labor markets, of local government institutions, of local credit markets, and, and so on. And this is often reinforced by very hierarchical social relations. Um, different parts of the country call these different things, and, and they take different forms. But basically, you have many, many different social conditions where lower caste, more marginalized groups will have to kind of perform various labor uncompensated or other things for the more dominant upper caste groups. OK, so how are we going to take this to the data? Um, these are all really nice ideas. I'm, you know, I'm sure that a sociologist studying these things more deeply than I would say I have not done them justice. I'm an, I'm an economist trying to close some of the gap between our fields. Um, and really what I'm trying to do is take these ideas to the data and see if we can kind of apply some of the methods of empirical economics and, and try to test the role that these, uh, that these factors might be playing in, in determining economic opportunity in India. So we're going to use two basic data sources. The first one is, as I said, these anthropological surveys from the people of India from around 1990. It was done in 85 to 92. And this is for every, every one of those groups I was describing. The second one is the India Human Development Survey. So this was collected in 2011-12. Um, this is actually the second full-scale round of, of this survey that was done. Critically for us, it has a village-level questionnaire where you actually know the different groups that live in the village, and you know how many people they have, you know how much of the land they own. This is going to tell us who are the dominant groups in a particular location, right? And then we have a household survey, and that's going to have incredibly rich data on human capital accumulation, on economic outcomes, on access to services, on attitudes, and all sorts of other things besides. So let me tell you a little bit more about this People of India survey. Um, so the Anthropological Survey of India, originally set up by the British, um, conducted from 1985 to 1992, uh, an ethnographic survey of every group in the country. That was their goal. And their goal was to write up a brief anthropological profile of all of the communities in India. Actually, not so brief. It can often go into like 10 pages. Um, so they trained 500 scholars, a combination of government anthropologists and kind of professors and others working at universities and think tanks and things like that. And they spent 26,000 field days over the course of these seven years, conducting 25,000 interviews. They were aiming for five interviews per community. And they talked to 5,000 women. They wanted to talk to at least one woman in every group. So they weren't just getting the perspective of men. So as you can see, they only talked to five people per, per group. But they were trying to understand the basic cultural characteristics and other characteristics, ethnic and linguistic as well, of all of these different groups. And they tried to study each community in multiple places where possible as well. Again, they were trying to get away from just kind of getting the opinions of one dude and trying to get a broader sense of what are the common cultural norms, other characteristics held by these groups. While the results were first reported through long-form ethnographic narratives, um, the anthropologists in the anthropological survey then coded up binary indicators for nearly 900 traits, not all of these cultural, but near 900 traits across these 4,635 different groups. And it's exactly that that we're going to be working off of. This whole project is possible because of this amazing gentleman right here. This is Dr. Suresh Patil. He is a retired anthropologist in the Anthropological Survey of India. He was involved in putting together this quantitative data on all of these, these 900 characteristics for all of these groups. He led the Anthropological Survey in Karnataka for a while, conducted a bunch of these, these interviews. Um, he's written papers on this. He's now retired, living outside of Bangalore. Um, and we're working with him to understand these data. And we're going to be writing a paper with him, kind of introducing these data to the world, because we want to make it much more widely available than just, obviously, to our research team. 
So this is how the data came in. Lots of ones and zeros for all these different traits for these particular groups organized by state and then name. And here's a little listing of all sorts of different uh, norms. Succession goes to the eldest son. Succession goes to the eldest daughter. Not very many of those. Succession goes to the youngest son, youngest daughter, adopted son, adopted daughter. And they're not exclusive, right? It might be that a group has a couple of these different norms for, for succession. Let me just give you guys uh, some examples of that. So in dietary norms, we have vegetarian, vegetarian with egg, vegetarian with mustard, vegetarian with garlic. Women are vegetarian versus non-vegetarian. Cow beef is consumed, pork, wheat, and so on and so forth. Within marriage, divorce is permissible. Widow remarriage is permissible. Um, sorority junior is allowed, sorority senior. Only the husband can divorce, only the wife can divorce. Widower remarriage is allowed, and so on. Very, very detailed cultural norms for all these groups. Yeah, yeah I know you just showed, but so the data is for each individual who answered this or it's, it's per group. It's per group. Yeah, so, so based, based on all of the individual yeah, but conversations that they had, they put together five per group, and sometimes they're going to have probably different answers, right? Totally. And, and so they're trying to find the common theme in the group. The majority of the answers, or you so know? so the training manuals are a bit vague on this, right? There's nothing <laughs> other than kind of tell us what the basic norms are of this group, and so. My understanding is that if they talk to some, they're asking people not what do you do, but what does the group do? What is the common norm in the group, right? And then, so often it's going to be very clear. In India, it's often very clear this group is vegetarian, this group is not vegetarian. That doesn't mean that every single person is vegetarian, but it means as a traditional norm, that's what we do. That's what most people do in this group. And you said that they also tried to interview at least one woman per group, right? Uh, but they didn't. I mean, this, you don't know what women said versus what men said. You don't know any of this. All you have are these ones and zeros at the group level. Yeah, I would love yeah. to have, right? I would just love to have that initial data and understand the variation within these groups and all that kind of thing. Okay. So those, I just put these up, I just added these to the, the presentation just to give a bit of a sense of like the richness of the data that, that we're working with here. Birth and death rituals, these are very different across Indian groups. Most Hindu groups cremate, but they don't necessarily do them in the same way. Um, they have, whether they have pre-delivery rituals or post-delivery rituals and so on. Norms on the status of women. Um, we have a bunch of stuff on, are women allowed to drink alcohol? Are women allowed to smoke? Are women allowed to eat meat and so on? Um, there's a lot that we want to do here on gender norms, actually. <laughs> these norms are very strongly predictive of behavior. So we match these up to the IHDS, and then we see, does coming from a vegetarian community make them more likely to say that you're vegetarian? Yes. Um, if you're coming from an alcohol-consuming community, you're more likely to drink alcohol. You know, uh, widows are more likely to remarry when they're coming from communities that say that widow marriage is allowed. Um, more like you're much more likely to marry your cousin if you're coming from a community that says that cousin marriage is allowed, and so on and so forth. And it's not just like do you do the actual norm that we are recording, it's also more complex and, and distant behaviors. So there's a bunch of work on how um, inheritance norms or other characteristics of communities might shape sex ratios. India has very skewed sex ratios, a lot of sex selective abortion and discrimination against girl children. Um, so here you can see the communities that follow son inheritance are much more likely to have the third child be male after two elder sisters compared to communities that practice both son and daughter inheritance. Or here, there's a bunch of work, mostly from Africa, suggesting that pastoral communities, those that tend to move around more and herd animals rather than practice settled agriculture, again, much more likely to have big sex skews um, in the likelihood of a boy, uh, in this case, after, after the first uh, child is a girl here after the first two children girls. Okay, very quickly, I cut this part of the presentation way down, even though I'm really excited about it. Um, we're putting together a hundred year panel of these norms. So I told you about the 1990 norms. Uh, we're having ChatGPT read through 22,000 pages of these anthropological reports that the British did between 1880 and 1920. And we're coding up for all of these communities uh, as much as we possibly can, basically matching to the current norms. We're not going to be able to get lots of them, but we're going to be able to get lots of them. So 
um, you know, we're trying to develop methods to, to use GPT-4 as best as we possibly can. This is kind of the frontier of using machine learning to, to read these kind of texts. Um, I'm going to be presenting this at ETH pretty soon in a lab that specializes in text as data, and hopefully they confirm that we're on the right path or, or show us a different one. Um, but we're starting to make some, some really great track, get some really great traction on this. Um, there are a lot of big challenges. Um, you can only submit so much information at a time to GPT. Um, the accuracy is highest when given less text, um, worse when given pages and pages. Uh, accuracy is higher when asked about one norm at a time. That sucks for us because we have to pay for every word that's submitted. And so we have to submit this stuff over and over and over again in order to get the most accuracy in putting up each of these norms. Um, big challenge of how to handle missing data. So for example, they almost never write about patrilocality because almost every group in India is patrilocal, meaning that a married couple will stay with or near the, the bride, the groom's family rather than the bride's family, right? So they don't mention that. Can we assume that that means that the group is patrilocal and they're only going to mention it if in fact they're matrilocal or deviating in some sort of way? Tricky. Um, and then actually the cost. While this is much, much cheaper than doing this, having people do this by hand, we're still coming out at about 30 cents per norm per group right now. But the costs are falling considerably and I just put in a big ERC grant application. So hopefully the intersection of those two lets us make a lot of progress on. Okay, uh, diversion ended. Um, the other data set, as I said, is going to be data from this IHDS. Um, unlike most sample surveys, they actually ask a bunch about the village. And that's really necessary for us, because instead of having to infer who's the dominant group based on a sample of, say, 20 households in a village, they actually asked people in the village and came up with a village-level uh, data set. So we know all the group names. This we can match both to the individuals and the whole people of India. We know how much land each of the groups own, and we know the population of each group. And then in the household questionnaire, we're going to have a lot of really rich data, starting with educational data and health data, going into living standards, redistribution and access to government services, and then a bunch of other sort of attitudinal things as well that I'll, I'll tell you about. So to give a sample accounting, the IHDS starts with about 120,000 individuals. When we match up with historical norms, we lose just under a third of the sample. So people wrote in IHDS, they were just asked, hey, what group are you from? You know, And so I could have answered, I'm American, or I could have answered, I'm Ashkenazi Jewish, or just Jewish, or Reform Jewish, or who knows? I could have given a lot of different answers for that, right? I'm a Democrat, no. I mean, people understand like what their basic characteristics are, but these things get expressed in a lot of different ways. And so because of these inconsistencies, we end up losing about a third of the sample out of Because we're focusing on, on rural India and on this uh, institution of dominant caste, we're dropping urban observations. Um, and then because we're focusing on the non-dominant households and trying to understand how their distance to the dominant group is shaping their economic outcomes, we end up with 30,000 individuals at the end. And these guys are spread across just over 1,400 villages. What do I want you to picture when you think of a village? I want you to picture about 1,400 people. As I said, about six communities living uh, in a given, or six groups living in a, in a given village. Um, only 87 non-farm jobs per 1,400 people. So still very, very, very heavily agrarian. Half of households own land, the other half don't. And as I said before, half of the land, over half of the land is held by the single largest land holding community, largest land holding group in a given place. In our sample, we're going to see about 24 households per village. Um, overall, in our sample, we have nearly 900 dominant groups and almost 1,500 non-dominant groups in this. So we clearly don't have the entire 3,600 that, uh, that they did the, the people of India data for um, because this is a sample survey. OK. The entire empirical strategy here is going to be based off of a variation within groups in your cultural distance to the dominant group, to the elite group, in that particular location. So picture a village where the dominant group is A, and they're vegetarian, they practice dowry, and they permit child marriage, uh, sorry, cousin marriage. Group B shares two thirds of those norms. They don't, they're, they're non-vegetarian, so they don't share food norms, but they do share these other things. 
Group C only has one third similarity because they don't have, uh, they're not vegetarian. They practice bride price, not dowry, but they do permit cousin marriage. Group D doesn't share any of these. So they're the most distant in this village. But picture a different village with the same non dominant groups B, C, and D, but there's a different dominant group E. And these guys are vegetarian, but they practice bride price and no cousin marriage. Now, B is going to be far when before they were close, because they don't share any of those norms. D is going to be close when before they were far. And it's exactly that variation that we're going to be playing off of to try to understand how that shapes people's economic opportunity. So, as I said, we're going to measure cultural distance as basically just the share of norms that you don't have in common with the dominant group in your location. Okay. Now, a question I, I get a bunch is like, how do you want to weight these norms? We have hundreds of these norms, like which of these are important, which of these are not. I think that's an empirical question. What we're doing right now is we're weighting either by norm, basically saying, look, the anthropological survey decided to collect these norms, so we're going to count these norms equally. Or we made these broader categories, marriage norms, dietary norms, intoxicants, and so on. And we're going to weight equally by category, but then downweight the norms in the categories that have a gazillion norms relative to those that have very few. Those are the two ways we're doing it right now, and they basically give the same results. You know, we're thinking of more data-driven ways of doing this, um, but you know, it's not obvious how you do it. Okay, so on average, um, the distance score is about 25%. A non-dominant group will have about uh, three quarters of the norms in common and one quarter of the norms not in common with the dominant group in their particular village with a standard deviation of about 0.1. So when you look at the coefficients, you know, divide by 10 to get the impact of a, of a standard deviation change in cultural distance. We're going to run a pretty simple uh, difference in differences specification. So we're going to regress some outcome. You know, uh, do you have a non-farm job? Do you, are you in poverty? Um, how many years of education do you have? Uh, do you have confidence in local institutions? Whatever it is, we're going to regress some outcome. We're interested in beta 1, which is the coefficient on cultural distance to the dominant group in the village. We're going to have group fixed effects. So again, we're comparing the ashers that are found in places where they're more culturally distant to more culturally similar. This is not picking up just differences across caste groups. This is all about differences across individuals within groups. We'll also have district fixed effects to control for broad geographic differences. Um, in some of the regressions, we'll use some additional controls. We're going to cluster uh, standard errors at the village group level, so at the level of variation. We're, as I said, we're excluding all dominant group households. They all have distance zero, obviously, from their particular dominant group, um, but we're just going to throw out the dominant group households, even if they're found elsewhere. But we can include these guys as a match. So to be clear, the identifying assumption is that potential outcomes for members of non-dominant groups, conditional on the fixed effects of the group and, and district level, are uncorrelated with cultural distance. Okay. All right. Let's get into it. Oh, wait, I I I didn't get it. So you said that there's there's two differences. Two differences. There's one difference we're interested in, which is cultural distance. Yeah. But we're going to control for the group that you're in. So we're comparing it, and we're going to take out district fixed effects, which are basically just broad locational fixed effects, right? But basically, think of this as you're comparing ashers across different villages where they happen to be found in a place yeah. where the dominant group is a bit closer to their cultural norms to places where they're a bit further away. That's the effective estimation that we're doing. Okay, so there's a, there's a lot of literature on, on past and schooling. Um, do we find that people get less education when they're culturally distant from the dominant group? Five minutes, okay, so I better move very fast. Yes, people get less education. All the, in an econ talk, all the, all the work is in the setup. Now we can zoom through the results. They get less education. You know, on average, actually three years less of education. So 0.3 years less for a standard deviation increase in cultural distance. Um, this notice that this significance goes away for postgraduate. It's either that could be because so few people in these non-dominant groups are getting postgraduate education, or it might be that postgraduate education is not controlled by local elites, and so it ends up mattering less 
That's a hard thing for us to test. Um, we get sort of marginally significant results on height and a bit less on weight. So it looks like there's higher levels of stunting, um, but we're not, we don't have quite as precise the estimates on that. When we go to income and consumption, we find consumption is usually the favored way of doing, uh, of kind of looking at economic welfare rather than income, because income can bounce around so much from year to year, especially in agrarian society. Um, so consumption is kind of a smoother estimate of like permanent income. We find significantly lower consumption. This is even when controlling for education. So it's not all going through that education channel that I already showed you, even conditional on how educated you are. You're considerably poorer when you're more culturally distant from the dominant group. And basically the same results with income with a bit more noise. We wanted to see about agricultural labor markets, sharecropping and other sort of contracting around land and, and labor. Um, we haven't found any real outcomes on that yet. People seem to work more. Maybe that's related to their, their greater poverty when they're more culturally distant, but we're not finding big differences in either the likelihood of being in agricultural labor, in getting benefits from your employer, in time taken going to work. The IGS has a lot of questions on this, and we're just beginning to scratch the surface of kind of what's going on here. I, I should give you guys a sneak preview and, and roughly say we're not going to find much on mechanisms right now. So I'm going to zoom through a bunch of the mechanisms that we're not finding much of, but like we're at the point of the paper where we're still not quite exactly sure what's driving the really big economic disparities and educational disparities that we're seeing at the beginning. We want to look at access to government benefits. There's a lot of work from the U.S. showing that ethnic minorities are often discriminated against or face disparities in access to government services. Um, we show in India, in that segregation work that I talked about earlier, um, that Muslim and scheduled caste neighborhoods are much less likely to have health and educational facilities compared to nearby non-Muslim and non-scheduled caste neighborhoods. Um, so our prediction is that we're going to see reduced access to the government services that are disproportionately controlled by these dominant groups as you're more culturally distant. The challenge is that when you're more culturally distant, you're poorer. That's what we've already shown you. And when you're poorer, you're more eligible for all of these government programs. You're more eligible for and interested in these government programs than people who are richer. So actually, we find that being more culturally distant means you're doing more labor work in the National Rural Employment Guarantee even when we try to control for how poor you are. Uh, but of course, we measure that noisily. Uh, we find that that's the case. Your total government benefits are higher when you're more culturally distant. That effect maybe goes away with controls, maybe not. Um, we look at a whole bunch of other things. We basically don't find any results suggesting that people get less access to government services as the result of this. Um, as I said, our whole challenge is how do we try to properly control for how rich you are? and really just isolate your access to services that's not conditional on your economic status. And that's just a huge challenge when the whole government is trying to get more resources to the people who are poor. Uh, we asked about confidence in institutions. Our hypothesis is that kind of confidence in local institutions, like your village council, might have been lower when you're being more excluded or, or poorer as a result of this cultural distance. We're not finding it. Uh, we try to see whether people are more likely to experience violence. Have you been attacked or threatened in the last 12 months? Do you face a break-in? Are girls more likely to be harassed? Have you faced theft? We're not finding it. You know, it's not obvious that this is going to come from the dominant groups. This might come from any group. And so in future work, we'd really like to look at overall kind of cultural diversity in the villages and not just this one bilateral relationship between an individual and the people who control the land. We show a lot of robustness to different weights and different measures of cultural distance, these don't make a whole lot of a difference. Okay, so quickly, I guess I should wrap up and take two minutes. Uh, let me just address a few concerns and questions that come up a lot. One, is this driven by within group selection, which is differ differential mar um, migration of individuals within groups to different places? Could it be that the really talented ashers go to the places where they're more culturally similar, and the less talented ashers go to the places where they're more culturally different from the dominant group. It's possible. You know, we don't have like a perfect experiment here. We don't have a perfect pre-period before all this stuff. Cast this have been around for thousands of years. These cultural roots are deep. Um, we have looked a little bit into migration, and it doesn't look like we're seeing a lot of differential in or out migration 
in the places where people are more or less culturally distant. So at least in the present, it doesn't look like a whole lot of that is going on. Are we just showing that lower caste groups are worse off? Absolutely not. As I said, we're comparing within groups. So this is really about whatever group you're in. You could be in a very poor group, you could be in a richer group. Are your outcomes worse when you're more culturally distant from the dominant group? And the answer seems to be yes. Are we just measuring something about cultural receptivity to economic opportunity? There may be certain cultural characteristics that do make you more receptive to economic opportunity. It might be that if you have more liberal gender norms, then the women in your community are going to be more likely to go and work in new sectors that are growing up and offering jobs to women. Um, but we're, again, we're playing off of these interactions of your own culture and the culture of the dominant group around you, not just about your own characteristics. So what are our next steps? Um, at the, at the heart of our of this paper is the idea that cultural distance is going to reduce sort of cultural and economic contact. It's going to make it harder to spend time together. If I don't have the same dietary restrictions as someone else, I'm not going to eat dinner with them. My, my grandparents and great-grandparents kept kosher, and so they absolutely would not share a meal with people who didn't have the same dietary restrictions. And of course, that reduced their sort of the social capital that they had with those people. Um, in this very rich network data collected by Banerjee et al. in a series of, of different papers, they know about almost every interaction between every single person in the 75 villages in Karnataka. And that's going to really allow us to characterize whether cultural differences do seem to be associated with kind of very different economic and, and, and social context. We'd like to know whose behavior is changing. Right now, we're not looking at things at all from the standpoint of the dominant group. We'd really like to know, are they practicing more discrimination? Do they practice more untouchability? Do they consider the lower caste people in their, in their villages more polluting when they're more culturally distant? So we're setting that up. Um, we're still trying to figure out how can we kind of get traction on this issue of access to government services and, and try to get out of this conundrum of poverty kind of messing up our estimates. Um, we're constructing families at outcomes like access to government services and so on to try to get away from the fact that we have these hundreds of different variables, um, both to up the signal to noise ratio and address the issue of multiple hypothesis testing and the fact that, you know, just spuriously some things are going to show up as significant if you run enough regressions. And finally, I'm looking into ways of, of getting more confident in the exogeneity of the dominant group, looking at sort of border areas where the Marathas conquered into the Deccan, into the center of India, and kind of where they stopped conquering and therefore where they stopped being the dominant group and just kind of focusing in on those border areas as maybe places that are a little bit more comparable and we can get a little bit better variation in, in who's the dominant group. And as I've already said, this is part of this broader agenda where we're trying to put together this 100-year panel of, of cultural change. It'll really be the first of its kind. Generally speaking, we don't have this kind of long-run cultural change data and study the, cult, both the cultural drivers of economic development um, as well as the impacts of long-run economic change on cultural evolution. So, for example, the effects of urbanization on caste and gender norms or climate change and in-group favoritism at the local level. So I'm just conclude by saying, look, I think in this paper we show that uh, elites control access to economic and political resources, no particular surprise there, um, but that cultural capital, this cultural proximity to elites appears to be a really important driver of, uh, of first-order economic outcomes like educational um, and, and consumption and, and, and income measures. Um, as you saw, the mechanisms are definitely unclear right now. We're at that phase of the project where we're trying to figure out what's going on. Is this all sort of academic um, theorizing? No, I don't think so. I, I think that really trying to understand what drives economic opportunity at the local level and the sort of the role of dominant castes and the role of cultural proximity to them um, can really inform potential policies to try to close these gaps. If a bunch of what's driving inequality in India is about really, really local factors, then we need to start thinking about potential solutions. So one is to reduce the power of local elites. That can be through structural transformation where the economy transforms away from agriculture, thereby eroding the power of these groups when they control the land, better oversight over local government institutions, so on. It could be through investments to help lower status groups obtain cultural capital. The, the Central Bank of Peru runs a training course for all of the people who come in and are recruiting heavily from indigenous communities in Peru to try to give more opportunities to them, to actually train them on all sorts of cultural characteristics of what it takes to succeed in the central bank and as an economist and in Lima and so on. So should we think about kind of taking seriously these, culture, these differences in cultural capital held by different groups? And the third, and I think this is happening a lot in the West, and I'm very supportive of it, 
is broader social change to try to raise the relative the, the relative status of non-elite culture. It, it used to be acceptable to like make fun of someone for speaking what we consider to be grammatically incorrect, right? It's, that's no longer acceptable. We no longer think that's okay to say you don't know how to hold a knife and fork or you're not speaking the Queen's English or whatever else. We change the relative status of different cultural characteristics, and I think that's probably an important part of the sort of broader development and, and, and uh, system of, of social progress. So let me end on that note. Thank you guys so much. Really looking forward to your comments. Well, uh, thank you, Sam, for your insightful presentation. I'm going to open the floor now for questions from the audience. Uh, online attendees can use the raise hand uh, function to pose your questions or place your questions into the chat, stating your name and affiliation where possible. Uh, but let's start with questions from the room. Yes. Um, thanks for the talk. It's um, interesting. Uh, and and made me think about a lot of things. Um, the question I had, is, and I'm and and I am an anthropologist by training, is you chose cultural capital, but sometimes I I noticed you were also interchanging that with social capital. And what is the relationship between what you're talking about and social capital? You know, in terms of it's not just how you bury your dead or how you get divorced, but it's, it's about who you know and you know, how does that play into all of these things? Great, thank you. Why don't I take a, that's a great question. So, um, let me take a few questions yeah. because they might be interrelated. Hi, thank you for the presentation. It's really interesting, Liz from the IC. Um, I'm interested in your use of the 1985 to 1992 data. Um, I'd like you to talk a bit more about using data that is A, 30 years old, but also, if I understood it correctly, is obviously collected by white males in a sort of semi-colonial type um, activity. Um, so you did talk a bit about it being 20% women who answered the survey, but how many females were actually involved in collecting the data? And what does that mean for our understanding of those uh, those so cultural norms if we've got a very singular perspective on that cultural norm data gathering process. Thank you. Can we do one more? Yeah, yeah, let's do so, one. So George? Let's do two more since that's the entire yeah. room and then so we'll go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Sam. Uh, thanks for the great talk. I think it's very interesting and you also it's interesting that you also touched on the policy aspect of it at the end. Um, I'm an anthropologist. And I work on caste. So my name was anthropologist. So, um, so I'm just wondering what would be the specific contribution of this work? Because anthropologists have studied caste, and it is an area that has been exhausted in many ways. Now, to go back into the the, the People's Survey of India, and that was conducted 100 years ago, 120 years ago. So there is a uh, there's a problem with that survey itself. A lot of those ideas that talked about cultural dominance were actually drawn from Brahminical notions of scale. Yeah. So therefore, the very fact that you're drawing all that dominant ideas of Brahmins and then using that as a way of understanding cultural capital becomes problematic. And this has been also found by anthropologists like Nicholas Dirks, who wrote his book on Casts of Mind, and you yeah. showed how colonial uh, knowledge building and also the issues like the census and so on, what was so fussy into kind of very ordered. Um, and therefore, a lot of Brahminical values got crystallized in the process. Yeah. Yeah. And that gets repeated. Yeah. Um, and therefore, uh, a contribution of a study going, you know, to going back into those data and one with the Human Development Survey of India at the moment. Um, I'm not sure in terms of contribution it makes, first of all, except what has been already said about caste. In, in, in concrete, practical policy terms, I think most of the people who live in the villages of India, they all understand what is dominance, what is exploitation, who needs to be given, uh, empowered. There isn't anything that Perhaps a study like this is able to contribute. I mean, this is my 
may be biased because being an anthropologist living in the field uh, and working with uh, mostly from Dalit communities. Yeah. Uh, so they all know where is the empowerment is required. So I don't know how far this study can be Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I've seen that you have checked many things. I'm curious if you have checked sp spatial correlations. Yeah. Because I will expect that maybe in our region, where one of the dominant groups in a certain village is similar to other groups in the nearby villages, maybe the effects you are finding there are stronger. So I don't know, maybe there is an interaction between how isolated a group is and how strong is this effect you, you find, it's just a curiosity. Great, thanks. Um, okay, starting at the top. So cultural capital versus social capital. I, I tried to stay away uh, from using the word social capital. I used it in, in, in sort of one instance, I think, when talking about like the, the ties that, that bind groups together. Um, I, I'm thinking of this very much as being about cultural capital, that when we have, when I share cultural characteristics with the dominant group in my place, we're going to socialize more, we are going to trust each other more, we are going to have more contact, and, and it's going to be easier for us to cooperate economically or otherwise. So that's the way I'm, I'm thinking of it. That cooperation often gets called sort of fuzzily social capital, right? But specifically, I'm talking about the shared cultural characteristics that enable us to kind of work together. And as I said, that can be about the dominant group discriminating less when they see the non-dominant group as more human or more similar to them. That can be about our building kind of trust and a direct relationship that didn't necessarily exist just because we can actually break bread together or, or otherwise spend time in the same places. It can take a lot of different forms. And you know, one of the things I was hoping in this study is that we'd be able to shed some empirical light on the forms that that does actually take, both the norms that matter so I actually should have mentioned that as well. I think one of the ways forward is to better understand what are the norms that actually matter for economic outcomes, right? It may be that while the anthropologists collected tons of information on marriage norms, those are kind of semi-private to each different community. It doesn't matter that much whether you pay a dowry and I pay a bride price, who cares? But you know, taboos around intoxicants and food and so on end up being really consequential because those actually shape day to day whether we spend time together and therefore trust each other or not. Right. So I'm hoping we can kind of make some some progress on that. Um, Sam, we have we have two minutes left. So. Okay. So let me. Okay. So very 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 fast. Um, I still think we make lots of contributions. Um, you know, I, I think part of the, the the point here is that I think qualitative and quantitative researchers often think a bit differently about these things. I think that, you know, my work on segregation, it's not new that India is segregated, but I'm putting some numbers on it. And, and I think we're able to advance the conversation because we're saying this is systematic across India. You know, there are lots of people who say, ah, India is not that segregated. I'm not saying that this is going to change their views necessarily, but, but by doing this at scale and systematically, I think that it moves the conversation, even if there are some people who already have been saying that, right? And I, I don't think I'm saying anything totally new to some. Um, the 85 to 92 data was collected by no whites. Um, there might have been a couple of white anthropologists in the, involved in some sort of way, but this was, as I said, by the people of India, for the people of India in the modern Indian data. Now, the old 1800s data was obviously a, a very colonial enterprise. Um, I guess the broader point I would make here is that um, surely there are biases in these data. Surely the biases are coming from the fact that these data are collected by highly educated anthropologists. Um, these are experts in their areas. They were sent into the areas that they were considered to know pretty well. But everybody's carrying around these biases. And the fact that they're disproportionately male, the fact they're surely disproportionately upper caste, though I don't have any particular data on that, is going to introduce some biases. I don't think into this particular work, because this is looking at the interactions of the cultural characteristics of these different groups at the local level. And so I don't quite see where that's coming in, but I'd love to have more of a conversation on that. Um, likewise, on the sort of the way old grammatical notions were kind of fixed by the British and, and propagated through the system, surely true. I think the work on this is really good. That's definitely the case. I think what we want to do is try to find cultural characteristics that probably were measured pretty well despite these notions, right? Um, things like dietary norms and so on. That are, that are pretty kind of widely agreed upon and objective, 
and see how these change and whether, you know, we're going to be able to study how groups copy other groups and move in the direction of theirs or so on. Um, so we're going to try to isolate the norms that we don't think kind of are so full of these old um, scientific racist or, or other really problematic views. Um, finally, on the issue of spatial correlation, yeah, uh, we, there's a lot more that we can do kind of econometrically on, on this stuff. I think a really interesting questions around, is there something about the larger environment and not just the dominant group in the particular area that's shaping my opportunities? Tons of, I would love to hear your thoughts on it. Lots of places that we can go. I hope that, that addressed a lot of the Okay, so it has been a pleasure for me to chair today's event. Thank you very much to Sam for presenting this seminar, and thank you to everyone in the audience who joined us. And well, if someone still has questions, maybe you can do it after the seminar ended. Uh, and until next time. Okay. Oh, sorry. Let me just say one more thing for your thought, <laughs> which is I think on on the horn on online is Vidisha Mehta, who's done absolutely amazing. Are in work on this project. Couldn't have happened without her. So thank you so much, Felicia. You are very much appreciated. <laughs> now you guys can clap.